Welcome to our Bible study at the House of Abundance, San Antonio, Texas. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is always a delight to have the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for all you have taught us so far from our study of the book of Romans about our salvation and all the privileges that come with it. As we start this new section of the book that teaches us how to live out our new life as Christians, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will give us an understanding heart and a teachable spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we are studying chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. In this chapter, we begin a new section that takes us to the end of the book of Romans. It deals with practical teaching based on what Paul has been teaching us in the first 11 chapters of the book. The following is a reminder of what we have been taught so far about what Jesus has done for our salvation. We have been freed from the penalty and power of sin. We now have the Holy Spirit living in us. We are sons and daughters of God by adoption heirs and joint heirs with Christ, we now eternally, we are now eternally linked with Christ. We are the elect of God, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We are free from condemnation as no charge can ever be laid against us. And perhaps the most important of all, there is nothing, nothing which can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying now, now that we are no longer who we used to be, this is the way to live out your new life. So we now go to the passage, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul begins chapter 12 by saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. The word, therefore, points back to all that he has written in chapters 1 to 11, which I have summarized above, and also points forward to how we as Christians should now live. We can no longer live as we used to live before God saved us. Paul appeals to us based on the mercies of God, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable sacrifice. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice takes us back to what Paul says earlier in Romans 6, 11 to 13. Romans 6, 11 to 13, 
that because of Christ's death and resurrection, we believers are dead to sin and alive to God. I read, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God. That's verse 11. And verse 13 goes on to say, And do not present your members, that is, your bodies, the members of your bodies, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. When we offer ourselves, that is our bodies to God for his use, sin would not be able to control us through our bodies. And we will have the power in Christ to resist temptations. Holy means set apart consecrated entirely to God. Jesus lived a holy life while on earth, and we must serve God in holiness of life. Our lives must be set apart, reserved, and spent for the glory of God. Acceptable. Our sacrifice must be pleasing to God and reasonable, meaning that such a gift is the only rational response to all the good gifts that God has showered on us. Verse 2 says, and be not conformed to the world. This means that we should not comply with the rules and standards of this world. We should not follow the world's way of thinking and behaving. We should not acquire human wisdom and values. The world's way is evil and hostile to God because it's, it is under Satan's rule. 1 John 2, 15 to 17, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, describes the pattern of the world as the lust of the eyes, that is, coveting the things that appeal to the eyes, the lust of the flesh, that is, impure and immoral desires, and the pride of life, that is, pride that comes with wealth, possessions, positions, achievements, etc. Do not be molded by the values of the world. Being conformed to the world tempts you to walk away from your devotion and commitment to God. Remember that Jesus suffered on the cross to deliver us from the world, its power, and its influence. And then we are asked to be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change the way you think. How do we think? How do we think about God? About life? About death? Do I think like the world around me? Or is my thinking in line with the word of God? Am I Christ-like in the way I think? We should have a biblical mindset in the way we think. The way to renew our minds is by reading and meditating on the word of God and applying its principles to our daily lives and by staying more in the presence of God. Verses 3 and 5. I read, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. 
For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. That's three to five. Having told us the need to live a new life conformed to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and not to the pattern of this world, Paul starts with how we should think about ourselves. He says, do not think more of yourself. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. God has given everyone one or more gifts that can be used in his service. The gifts have been given so that each person can strengthen the church. As the human body is the unity with many members, each having its own function, so is the body of Christ. The church is a unified body under the headship of Christ, but the members have different functions and each member of the body belongs to the other members. It is important to have a proper evaluation of ourselves so as to avoid self-pride. A proper evaluation of ourselves will help us to see that we are not better than others. The right way to evaluate ourselves is in spiritual terms, not according to our family background, our education, our wealth, our achievements, our possessions, etc. This is probably why, what Paul means by asking us to think soberly, to view ourselves with sound judgment. We should remember that we are all made in the image of God. We believers are God's children. Christ died to save us from the power and penalty of sin. We are all filled with the Holy Spirit and God is at work in us. So we should not compare ourselves with others. We should be satisfied with being who God has called us to be according to the faith that he has given to us. Now we go to verses six to eight. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching he who exalts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, and he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Excuse me. In these verses, Paul discusses how we should serve God with our spiritual gifts. A spiritual gift is a special, unique ability given by God to every believer for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ and glorifying God. According to verse three of this chapter, God has given each of us a measure of faith. There's no one of us that does not have a measure of faith. The Holy Spirit is the source of all spiritual gifts, but gifts differ from one person to another according to the grace given to us. 
Apart from the gifts mentioned in these verses, there are several others mentioned in the Bible. But for now, we shall discuss the ones mentioned here. It talks about prophecy. It's a special ability to momentarily bring a word or a warning, an exhortation or revelation from God under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Ministry or serving is God-given ability and power to render practical assistance to members and leaders of the church. Teaching, God-given ability to clarify and explain God's word in order to build up the church as a body and as individuals. Then we have exhorting or encouraging. Encouragers are those specially gifted to motivate other Christians to deeper faith in Christ and in their dedication to Christ. They have the desire, ability, and power to uplift others and inspire them to trust God, especially in difficult times. Giving is another gift. This is not just about tithes and offerings. Those who have this gift of giving have the God-given desire, ability, and power to give freely and generously of their financial and material resources to the needs of God's people and the advancement of God's work. And then we have leading. Leaders are gifted to guide and oversee various activities of the church for the spiritual benefit of all. And the last, but not the least mentioned here is showing mercy and kindness. This gift is especially God given desire, ability and power to help and to comfort those in need or in distress, those who are suffering or who are afflicted by acts of mercy and kindness. All Christians are endowed with at least one of these gifts. There's no one without a gift. And we must have a strong passion to honor God with our gifts. We need to discover what our gifts are and find opportunities to use them to serve God and his people. And then the final section, verses 9 to 21. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another not lagging in diligence fervent in spirit serving the lord rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation continuing steadfastly in prayer distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality bless them who persecute you Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for thing, good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, 
but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This section discusses the marks or the traits of a good Christian. It describes how a Christian should behave. The love that Paul is talking about here is the highest form of love, the agape, agape love. It is a self-sacrificial love. The agape is what describes God's love for us. This kind of love is the one that seeks the best for another. Paul says, the love we have for one another should be without hypocrisy. That is, love that is not wearing a mask. Genuine love. Our love should not be fake, like Judas, who betrayed his Lord and Master with a kiss after selling him for 30 pieces of silver. We are to abhor what is evil. Abhor means hate strongly. We are to abhor what is good. God hates evil and he loves what is good. We should hate evil because it hurts other people. It stains fellowship. Evil is prevalent in the world, but we must not tolerate it. The Bible urges us to flee every appearance of evil. We should cling to what is good. We are to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, honoring one another even as we serve the Lord diligently and fervently. I'm talking about serving the Lord diligently and fervently. Do we remember the zeal and enthusiasm we had for the things of God when we got born again? How we were on fire for God, going around to share the gospel, attending Christian fellowships and gladly offering our services in churches and other Christian gatherings. I hope that fire is still burning. If it is going out, we need to reignite it. This is what Paul is referring to in verse 11. Christians should not offer their services to God half-heartedly or reluctantly, or in a lazy manner. And then he talks about rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. When tribulation comes, Christians should hope and rejoice in the hope. Our joy is not only found in the circumstances that surround us, but in our hope. We should rejoice and be patient in suffering, not because we enjoy the pain, but because we know that God can use life's difficulties and the devil's attacks to teach us perseverance and deeper, deepen our trust in God. We can look beyond what is happening or what we are going through to find hope in our relationship with God. Hope and patience are what keep a believer going when Satan strikes. In the face of problems and difficulties, we can go on 
because hope fills our hearts with expectations that things will change for the better. Hope sustains us as we hold on to God's promise that there are better days ahead and as long as God is in control. Verse 13 talks about distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Hospitality involves showing love to strangers, housing travelers if necessary. Paul is saying that as we dedicate ourselves to our fellow brothers and sisters, we will also have opportunities to minister to strangers and thereby showing them the love of Christ. Verses 14 to 21. In these verses, Paul issues some commands that most of us may find difficult to obey, especially in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It will, it will be recalled that Jesus gave almost the same command in Matthew 5, 43 to 20, 44. 43 to 44. You have heard that it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, the I referring to Jesus, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despisefully use you. What is being said here is that our treatment of others should be independent of the treatment we receive from others. It's not easy. We cannot do this without dependence on the Holy Spirit. It is easy to bless those who love us and those who bless us, but not those who hate us. Even when we are determined to, not to curse anybody, we only need to drive along the highway and come across a careless driver who almost caused, causes us to have an accident. And before we know it, we are already raining curses on him. May God help us. We must remember how God pours out his love on us and rely on Jesus to help us. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We must try always to enter into the emotions of others. Even Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. Because we believers are one body, when one hurts, everyone feels the pain. And when one is joyful, everyone can rejoice. We cannot be indifferent to the suffering or joy of our fellow believers. In verse 16, Paul urges us to be humble and, be, and not be wise in our own opinion. Verse 17, he urges us not to repay evil for evil. Some ways in which people repay evil for evil today are by not forgiving someone who has hurt them, by keeping malice with the person, and by retaliation. But we have examples from the scriptures of people who did not repay evil for evil. David, for instance, when he had the opportunity to kill Saul, his arch enemy, he spared him. But God protected David and he still became king. Even Saul was ashamed of himself. 
Verse 18 says, live peaceably with all men. Paul, however, limits the command by adding the phrase, if it is possible. Because peace may not be within our own control. You may initiate peace and reach out to those who have, you have problem with. But both parties must want it. Both parties must want that peace. Some may reject your invitation to peace. In that case, you would have done your part as a child of God. You are not responsible for them. Verse 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, that is, to God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Believers are not to seek personal revenge. God is a better avenger than we are, and it is better to let God handle it. And so verse 20 says, Therefore, if your enemy hunger, hunger feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. When your enemies persist in their acts of hatred and wickedness, and you continue to respond with acts of kindness towards them, it will surprise them and probably bring shame and repentance to them. It is possible for a so-called enemy to become a friend. I have seen it happen. There is nothing the power of God's love cannot do. Which brings us to the last of Paul's exhortations. Do not be overcome by evil. Don't let over, uh, evil overcome you, but overcome evil with good. That brings us to the end of chapter 12. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this chapter in which Paul has spelled out some of the things we need to be doing as good Christians. We confess, Lord, that difficult as some of these things may appear, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Help us, Holy Spirit, not just to be hearers of your word, but also doers of the word. Praise be to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us next week at the same time when we shall be studying Romans chapter 13. Good night. <laughs>